What a, wow, just a powerful time of worship this morning. I don't, I'm at a loss with that. Um, if, you, if you weren't here for any of the announcements, I don't even know, I guess you only made them during the team meeting, but uh, we do have a couple of the food trucks out there today, so I hope you're hungry. I know I am, and after you get fed with the word, we can go out there and get some delicious food. I believe we have uh, the Yamo truck, which was here last time, and uh, I got the grilled cheese whatever. It had like pepperoni and grilled cheese on it. They actually sold out a sourdough last time, which was depressing, but it was still absolutely delicious if, if you didn't get any food. And I think the other one is the Harry's, uh, Hurricane Patties, not Harry's, thank you. Um, yeah, it was, last time was Casey's Dogs, um, and I didn't think you could really do much with a hot dog, but it was, that was the best hot dog I've ever had in my life. It was insane, and it was nice. It wasn't expensive, you know, like going to a ballpark and you get like an $8 hot dog that's, you know, tiny. It was delicious, but thank you. Thank you for being here, for taking the time to come here. I just want to take a moment and say that. I know uh, there's any number of other things you could be doing, but God brought you here for a reason, and I believe uh, he's going to speak to us this morning. We are going to be talking about uh, Gideon in Judges 6 and Judges 7, and... Um, if you can, just stand on your feet for me with the uh, reading of the Word of God, please, so we can honor Him. <clears throat> I'll be starting in verse 11. I'm reading out of the NIV. I know my dad likes to do the New King James. Uh, I like to be able to read it a little bit easier. Um, it's just my preference. Starting in verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah. Not Oprah. I know she's been around a long time, but... Um, <laughs> I, I couldn't let it go. I, I didn't want to say it because it's like a really cliche preacher joke, but I had to. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash that be Ezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a rind, wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon said, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us. <laughs> now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The, the funny thing is uh, here, if you didn't know when the Bible in the Old Testament says the angel of the Lord, it's actually talking about God. There's different, there's angels, there's messengers. But when it says the angel of the Lord, it's actually talking about, uh, most scholars believe, a pre-incarnate Jesus. So obviously, when you see him, the situation was absolutely so terrible that he had to come down before he was meant to come down in order to rescue us from, from our sins. So take that and put that in your back pocket. Uh, Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. In the last verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So as we're finding Gideon here, he's hiding in a wine press. He's threshing wheat where you normally wouldn't do that, and we'll get there. But he's hiding, but his thoughts here in this passage are on full display, and he's stuck in a situation of their own making. So the reason they're being so depressed is because the Israelites, typical of humanity, rebelled against God and fell back away, and they were in seven years of depression. And while the Midianites were physically oppressing them, we see by his words that he is being tormented by his thoughts. He's threshing wheat in a depressed area in what is probably a hole, and he's also having a depressing viewpoint of himself as a person. And today, once God wants to call you out of your cage and of your conscience and change your life so you can charge forward in the battle that you're facing. The title of my message today is Caged or Charging. Let's pray one more time. Lord, we thank you for this word, and we... Uh, You've been dealing with it with me for some time, and as I'm open to your word, I pray that your people are open to your word as, as, as well. Uh, your word does not return void, and we thank you, and we pray that it refines us through this, God, that you speak to us through this. I am just a vessel. Use me for your purpose, God. 
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As you're finding your seats, turn to your neighbor and ask, are you caged? Y'all thought that was a lot more silly than I did. <clears throat> Weird thing to ask in church, isn't it? Are you caged? Especially in America where we want to consider ourselves free, but, uh, well, I'm not going to get into all that. We'll leave, we'll leave politics for somebody else. Uh, actually, I got the idea from this. I was watching um, this masterclass video from Elevation Church on Stephen Furtick's new book, Do the New You. And he was talking to, I think it's Brendan Bruchard, who is a Christian, uh, I don't know how else to say it other than motivational speaker, um, somebody that isn't quite a preacher, but he still applies godly principles and, you know, biblical teaching to how he empower, helps empower people and help them live a better life. And there was one line in there that they, they said about Gideon, and it came out of nowhere and it just, it stuck out to me really far. They said, you know, you can be caged or you can be charging. And God just started dumping everything into me. And this was one of the weirdest <laughs> messages I have prepared yet, all like 10 of them that you've heard. Um, but it spoke to me, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited at what uh, God's going to use to speak to you. So just some real quick history. In Joshua 17, the reason why they're in this situation is the Israelites didn't completely drive out the Canaanites. Uh, from the land that they were supposed to do. They wanted the benefits of forced labor and they wanted the taxes that the Canaanites would bring. They, they stopped having confidence in God. They saw that the Canaanites had uh, chariots of iron. They had a superior military advantage to them. And they thought, you know, oh, we can't do this by our hands, which obviously they weren't supposed to. They were supposed to do it by God's hands. But they compromised because they lost their confidence. And they started integrating with the Canaanites instead of following God completely in obedience like he said to do. And so in Judges 2, it provides a recap of the entire Israelite invasion up until this point. Oh, the devil's fighting me today. No, thank you. Judges 2 provides a recap of the entire Israelite invasion of Canaan up until Joshua's death, and it so shows the results of incomplete obedience when in reality it is actually just disobedience. If God tells you to do something and you do it halfway, you're still disobeying him. Uh, the, the thing is, church, God doesn't break his covenants. We do. He always holds his end of the bargain, but we, we don't. He, he doesn't stray from us. We're the ones that stray from him. God never designed defeat for his people. We just don't listen. We do it halfway, and we think we're doing it, and we're wondering why we're struggling, but we're not designed for defeat. We are destined for victory. Romans tells us, Paul tells us in Romans how we are more than conquerors through Jesus. There is no height, there's no depth, there's nothing in your past, nothing in your present, and nothing in your future that will ever separate you from the love of God. I know a lot of Christians like to think, uh, you know, that once we get saved, we're better than everybody else, but that is never, ever going to be the case. And if you want to bash people, I've said it before, just stop. Stop, you said it last week, put your stones down, quit throwing it, you're living in a glass house. And while you're sitting there wanting to pick apart somebody else's life, you know what you're doing is you're hiding what you're doing behind your back. We're all, we're all, fault, we're all faulty. We're without... Yeah, you know what I'm saying. That just twisted up. But uh, so Judges, the book of Judges is actually a cycle. <clears throat> and Israel rebels. This is the cycle. Israel rebels. It rejects God until the situation is so desperate that they have no choice but to cry back out to them, him. They finally remember him, and then he raises a judge to save them through him. He's, his spirit is on the judge, and then they're good until the judge dies, and then they go back into rebellion, and the process begins again, but actually it gets increasingly worse each time. And if you don't deal with something completely when God tells you to, it will come back to haunt you. <clears throat> so they integrated with the Canaanites for the benefits. The forced labor brought an easier life. But easier doesn't birth excellence, and it produces laziness. And provi by providing a lack of strength, all it does is produce a life of struggle. If you go to the gym at all, you understand the importance of struggle. You do not get stronger without struggle. You don't build muscle without struggle. If you go to the gym 
It's going to be hard at first, but eventually you get to the point where your strength increases and what was heavy, what was hard is now easier, but you can't stay at that same weight. You have to increase the weight load each time in order to better yourself, in order to push yourself, and in order, order to force yourself to become stronger, to become faster, to become more fit, to become more athletic. You don't just, nobody at any level of sports got there by just doing it once and then getting, away, getting you know, done with it and they were just magically a major league baseball player are, are you know, playing in the NFL. It is struggle that produces strength. <clears throat> and it is wanting a life of ease that makes us become lazy. We don't strive for anything anymore because we think we don't need anything anymore. We have everything we need right here on an iPad or the phone in your pocket. You can order DoorDash because you're too afraid to go back in line and talk to anybody, or you can now order the stuff where people go and get your groceries for you. Um, and now we're at the point where we're expecting things so fast. If you go through the drive through and you don't get it in under five minutes, you're losing your ever loving mind. I mean, have you guys ever seen somebody in the drive through line just going haywire on someone <laughs> working the counter as if it's their fault because they're just typing in and putting your money in the register and they're losing their mind thinking it's their fault for waiting longer than a few minutes. It's just ridiculous. <clears throat> so the Israelites, they quit striving for God because they were too busy synchronizing with sinful people. Church, when you don't disconnect from who God tells you to disconnect from, you, ev you will eventually become more like them instead of more like God. And so, <laughs> some people don't disconnect from the people that drive them away from God because they want to keep them around for the, be the benefits, like the Israelites keeping the Canaanites around for the benefits. Uh, we'll just get a little deep in here today. I know that some people, you keep people around because of the sex that they provide you, and that's why you keep running to your ex. There's some people you keep around because you like to gossip, and so you get together with them, and you just keep gossiping with them. And I'm not judging. I'm not saying I'm perfect. So before you're looking at me thinking I'm you know, bashing you and judging you over the head, I'm just calling it like it is. You know, you're, you're stuck because you're gossiping with them. You're not disconnecting from them, or you know, maybe they're bringing money in through whatever kind of situation is coming in with there, but it's because you're synchronizing with people that you're still suffering and you're still struggling. That's right. And we often, uh, the problem is we don't connect with people. I'm sorry, we connect with people who bring nothing to the table and if they're not helping you push forward for growth, they're doing nothing but holding you back and bringing you down to their level of laziness. Yeah. And we'll never realize, we will never realize how bad the situation is until we forget God, until it gets to the point that it starts to feel like he has forgotten us. This is where we find the Israelites time and time again. They keep going for the false gods and they forget the true God, the only God, and then they get to a point of too much struggle and too much pain and too much depression and too much disgusting behavior going on that they finally have to cry back out to God because he has removed his hand from them. So now where they are here is because the, uh, the pressure, I want to say this, the pressure will make you remember your provider. There is a reason for your suffering. There is a reason for your struggle. <clears throat> the Israelites now, in the beginning of Judges 6, I know we didn't read it, we jumped into verse 11. But the Israelites are here because they can't, they can't plant food anymore. Every time they plant something, the Midianites and the enemy comes and they steal all their crops or they ruin their crops. And then all the livestock that they have with them as well tramples all the ground and makes it like un hard to use, unusable, whatever you want to call it. And they even, if you think with the amount of livestock that is with them, that's also eating the grass as well. So they're losing their grass, they're losing every way to provide for them, and that's why they're in a situation of complete famine and suffering, they're living in caves, they're hiding, and this is where we find Gideon, when we find him. And, and let me just say, depending on when somebody meets you is going to be their impression of you, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but depending on what day somebody meets you or even what minute somebody meets you, they'll form an impression of you. So Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. And I know nowadays we have no idea really what that means unless you've studied your Bible a little bit. So I will tell you, the threshing of wheat is usually done on a hill where it is windy. You were supposed to throw it up into the air and it would, the wind would separate the lighter chaff and blow it away and then the heavier grain would fall down where you could gather it. So with Gideon being in a wine press, he was surrounded by walls and he was in a depressed area in like a hole 
where there was no wind. So he's sitting here struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling to do something that should not have been that hard, but he's there because he's hiding from the Midianites who have been completely decimating their land. I've already told you they would invade and ruin the crops. This is obviously a desperate situation. This is seven years of oppression. This time, on this cycle, this, this isn't the first time the Israelites have done this. This is seven years just for the cycle of Gideon in Judges. Seven years of oppression. Seven years of famine. Seven years of hiding. Seven years of desperation. I don't know how long you've been dealing with something. Some of us have also been dealing with stuff for seven years. And it is important to note, seven is God's number. <laughs> And it is an interesting number that if you are dealing with something and it is the seventh year, just hold on because he's about to show up. And Gideon here is focused on providing for his family in an incredibly difficult way, but he is committed to it. He is focused on providing for his family. Obviously, he's still hiding, but he's making sure that his family is coming first. He's making sure that they can eat what little food that would be. But God's call often comes while we are committed to the current challenge. We often get so focused on what God's going to do next, what we think he's going to do next, what we want him to do next, and we start to neglect what he's wanting us to do right now. Gideon was providing for his family, but God is about to show up and provide for his people. And like Gideon, God often comes to us with an opportunity, but we start giving him our objections. We say, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources. I don't have enough friends. I don't have enough knowledge to do what I'm about to do. I don't have enough contacts for my business to succeed. We don't have enough volunteers in the church. We don't have enough money to fund this. We don't have enough money to do this. We start giving objections when God is placing the opportunity in front of us. And we come to verse 12, and he says, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, He says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. It's easy to gloss over that. You see mighty. God is calling him mighty, but he is literally hiding. He is fearful. He is a coward. He's hiding in a wine press. But God God doesn't call you by how you see yourself. He doesn't call you by the labels that everyone else gave you. God doesn't call you by your current state of mind or even your current state of being. God is outside of time, but we're confined by it. And there is a reason he's calling you. Where you see fear, God sees faith. Where you see failure, God sees your future. Where, he see, where you see a doubt, God sends a dream. Where you see darkness, God sends deliverance. Where you see lack, he sent a lamb. Where you see rejection, God sees redemption. Where you see your suffering, he is still sovereign. He knows your pain and he has a purpose for it. You may feel dead inside, but he is not done if you're not dead. And in verse 13, Gideon talks to God, who he didn't know was God at the time, just like we do. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Have you ever felt this way? Nobody? Oh, okay. I guess I'm the only one, you know, when you pray and you're like, God, where are you at? What is going on? And we like to neglect the fact that often we're in a situation of our own making and we're blaming God for problems that we brought on ourselves. But this is because this is fueled by fear. Fear is what attacks our faith. And I want you to know fear is more than a feeling. Being afraid is a feeling. You can feel fear. The problem is we start to say that we are afraid. And, but fear is a spirit that you need to reject. You need to start rejecting the spirit of fear. God, the Bible tells us God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. You need to reject it. And I know that sounds a lot easier than it is, but if you get stuck, it's because you stopped. It doesn't matter if you're afraid in the current moment. I still get a little afraid of coming up here every week. But I'm only stuck if I stop. And you have to reject it. You have to shake it off and know that you have the faith that when you move forward, God will meet you there. All he wants you to do is take a step towards him. 
but we make our feelings our identity. We have this immediate impulse to react. Like when somebody tells us something, we have to respond immediately. We can't just let it linger. Or if you're one of those people that's in the shower like two weeks later and you finally come up with the correct response of how you do it and you want to text them back. This is why it is so important the way that you interpret things. The way that you interpret things is super important. Interpretation, sorry, I just bought my tongue at Target. Interpretation leads to identity. How you interpret something is how you're going to put an identity on yourself. If you've ever had a bad day at work, We don't have those here at the church, but if you've ever had a bad day at work and you think your boss is just absolutely awful or he never listens to your ideas and everything you bring to him, he has something that he wants to say against it. I'm just kidding. This doesn't happen here, but you know, in my last job, um, no, but have you ever had a bad day at work and you're like, wow, my boss is, uh, what's the sanctified word? A jerk. (laughs) My boss is a horrible person. And then that leads you to interpret the situation from negativity. So then you start believing that you are no good. Nothing you ever do is ever going to be good enough. You're not going to do a good enough job at your job. Now you're going to get fired. Now you're not going to make enough money. And now your family is going to be living on the streets of San Francisco or something where it's widely accepted. Do you see how quickly it snowballs when you start to interpret things the wrong way? But we keep going to the world for our identity but it's more, it's more confused than we are. You can identify as anything you want nowadays in the world. I'm surprised we don't just have an endless amount of bathrooms. If you want to walk out of here today and post on Facebook that you now identify as a Siberian husky that lives in Alaska, somebody will be like, I'll buy you some, some Purina or something. You can identify as whatever you want. We are no longer on the internet right now, so I'll just keep going. Um, you can identify as anything you want. The world doesn't care. The problem is we keep going to the world for our identity, but we need to be going to the word for our identity because we are made in God's image, but we misplace our identity in Christ. You are made by him, through him and for him and in him, but we casually throw it off with our tongue. When you say, I am afraid, when you say, I am fearful, when you say, I am a failure, when you say, I am depressed, when you say, I am a loser, when you say, I am so lost, when you say, I am confused, when you say, I'm not enough. And let me just drop this in here as well. These little horoscope things that you want to say, I'm a Libra or I'm a Gemini or I'm a Taurus. That's all just demons designed to get you to put your identity in them instead of God. You are made in the image of God, so your maker is your mirror, and you reflect God. Whatever you are saying after you say, I am, is something you're attributing to God. And God is not fear. God does not fail. God is not depression. God is not lost. God is not confused. He works it all together for his good, so you need to take back your identity. If death and life are in the power of the tongue, then your responses determine your consequences. And you need to realize and say, I am a child of God. I am forgiven. I am a new creation. I am an heir with Jesus. I am covered by the blood of the lamb. I am more than a conqueror with Christ in you. You are enough. And without God, the situation will always deteriorate. This is what judges shows us. It is increasingly worse. Like I said, until the cycle of Samson whose death only begins their deliverance from the Philistines. Judges shows us how God uses increasingly flawed men to accomplish his purpose in spite of their faults. Judges is full of flawed men and women, full of fearful men, full of unexpected men, full of the underdogs, the men that society would never look twice at. Men of faith, nonetheless, And yes, they had their flaws. And yes, they had their failures. But your flaws do not matter as much as your faith does. And if I had a microphone, I would have dropped it right there. Your flaws don't matter as much as your faith does. Gideon kept seeking signs, but he kept moving forward in his convictions of God, in his convictions about God. And so what you need to know is you may feel like a mess and you might even still be a mess, but you can move forward messy. You can still move forward. And in verse 15, 
We are working our way through this. Gideon replies. And I love it. Pardon me, my Lord. So proper. Gideon replied. How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest. You notice he doesn't say, how will I? He says, how can I? How can I? Are you like Gideon where you always want God to show you the entire path before you do something in faith? I thought I was the only one. Wow, you guys can be real and honest. Thank you. But the Bible says that his word is a lamp unto your feet. And the reason it says that is because the lights in the Bible would only light up their feet in order to show them, (laughs) in order to show them how to take the next step. And the reason God does not lay it all out for you is because then you will trust the path and not their provider. Faith is not needing to know what comes next. Faith is trusting in God while you take that next step. You'll never see the path that you're on until you get forward enough to look back and see all the dots that are being connected. Then the path starts taking shape. You didn't see it in the moment. You only see it in the memory. Why God did what he did. Why he delivered you in the way that he did. Why he held out. What he did for you. There's so many times where God does something for you and you don't even realize it in the moment until you get far enough ahead And then you can see what he did, why things are the way that they were and why people are removed from your life. And we'll see this in a minute, but God will remove people from your life if you won't. I'll just drop that there, but don't get so far enough that he needs to be the one to remove it. Oh, it's heavy. It's heavy. So Gideon says, how can I? I think this is his self-doubt. This is his self-deprecating thoughts. His tribe is the weakest tribe out of all 12 of Israel. His clan is the weakest in the tribe. And he is the youngest in his family. Sometimes the youngest is the best, but, you know, it's kind of how it often. They say, the saying is, first is the word, uh, you muted. Okay. (laughs) That was good. I'll give you that one. But this is putting himself, <laughs> himself lower than low. And this is where I think a lot of Christians have problems, <clears throat> is that we attempt to lower ourselves so much with a false sense of humility because we have just this really big irrational sense of pride and we have this really big fear of pride. And uh, our humility ends up not really humility, it's just hatred. And we don't humble ourselves, we just start hating ourselves. And we downplay everything that we do, all of the accomplishments that God makes through us, and we denounce ourselves straight into a depression and have no confidence at all. And this is just an attack from the enemy as he keeps turning my iPad off. But he puts himself low enough. And see, the the problem is, church, we accept Jesus, but we don't accept ourselves. Because all we do is compare ourselves to everyone else until we think that we will never be enough. We accept Jesus, but we don't accept ourselves. And I want to ask you, why why do we doubt when God doesn't? God chooses us, but we're like, no, you've got the wrong one. You, You found the wrong Jared when you looked through the phone book in heaven. But why do we doubt what God defines? God called him a mighty warrior, and here he is saying he's the weakest of the weakest, of the weakest. But God said, you're a mighty warrior. See, the thing is, God accepts us. He numbers the hairs on your head. He orders your steps and he values you. He considers you precious in his sight. You are a treasure. And we we return the favor by diminishing what he designed. And I know a lot of you immediately when I started talking about pride, you were thinking John 3.30 with, oh, he must become greater and I must become less. But let me tell you, this does not mean that you beat yourself into an oblivion. This doesn't mean that you think so little of yourself that you have absolutely zero self-worth and any confidence. 
This is being caged by your thoughts like Gideon. This is being a wimp in the wine press. This is being weep, weak in the wine press. This is giving in to fear. And our mind becomes manic and our thoughts are so destructive that they torment us. We become prisoners to our own perceptions of ourselves. And maybe you're accepting the labels of what others are putting on you. Maybe you're trying to get your validation through the vanity of social media. Gideon is here hiding his harvest from the Midianites, and now you're the one struggling in a cell of your own making. But God wants to use you. God wants to use you. He sees you how you are. He wants you in his story for his glory. You need to stop seeking validation from people. They're never going to be able to give it to you. They hate themselves. You have to go to the source. You have to go to your maker because they didn't make you. They don't own you. They can't put anything on you. They didn't create you. They don't know anything about you. They don't know everything about you. Only God does. They only know enough to judge you and to feel better about themselves. But God knows it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And when the one whose voice is greater than all shows up, When the Alpha and the Omega speaks, it negates the opinions of oppression. It marks out the messages from man, and it ends the accusations of the enemy. God's voice is over all. So why do we seek our validation from small-minded people? God does not call you by where you are or what you're currently doing. He calls you by your purpose because he knows the facts. He made you. He formed you in the womb. He gives the facts of who you are, the one that he always knew. God, yeah, I've been waiting on that one. God doesn't call Gideon saying, hey, you wimp, coward. He shows up and he says, I am with you, mighty warrior, man of valor, man of God. Stop looking at people for things they will never be able to provide and stop listening to what they say about you. Your maker is your mirror. So get your label from the lamb. The Lord, verse 14, the Lord turns to him and he says, go in the strength you have. God already told him, This was before he started giving objections. He already said, go in the strength you have because I'm sending you. Not the strength you think you have because obviously that's going to be too small. And not the strength that everyone else thinks you have because that's going to be even less. And not the strength that you think you will have when you get there. God says, you've already got it. Go in it. You've already got it. Go in it. You've already got the strength. Go in it. You've already got it. Go in it. I am sending you for this purpose. I'm sending you for this task. You have all the strength you need because I am with you. I'll always be with you. Stop thinking you can't because I've got big plans for you. I've got good plans for you. You've got it. Go in it. And after all of this, just like Gideon, he still doubts. And this is literally even later on after after he brings uh, an offering And and what's hilarious is, and I hope I'm right on the amount, and I'm sure you know it. Isn't it like 36 pounds of flour? Thanks for backing me up. They're in the middle of a famine, and he he makes an offering. It'll be 36. Somebody will correct me, I'm sure. But uh, whatever it is. He, they're in the middle of a famine, and he brings an offering that's made with like 36 pounds, whatever the amount is, for all you armchair theologians on YouTube. Uh, it is enough to feed an entire family. And this is only one person that he's making it for. So to me, that tells me that Gideon, while he didn't know it was God in the moment, he did know that it was somebody important enough to present a big enough offering. He's still afraid. And God burns this offering up in front of him and he still doubts. Throughout the entire story, there's still doubts. There's still fear. But you can move forward, Messi. You can move forward in your fear and you can feel afraid but still move forward. So then he gets to the point that he lays a fleece on the ground. He lays a fleece on the ground. He says, uh, you know, I'm going to put this out, God. Let it be wet when I wake up in the morning and let the ground be dry. And then God's like, all right, cool. And he does it. And then Gideon's like, cool, but do it again, but the other way now. And let the fleece be dry and let the ground be wet. And hey, have you ever, you know, you hear that and you're like, man, I wish God would give me signs like that. That would be so awesome, God, if you could just put a big billboard on 207 that says, hey, do this. Put my money here. Make this investment. God, if you could have told me 20 years ago to invest in Bitcoin, I could have so much to give to the church right now. 
But the problem with asking signs like this <laughs> is it shows your disbelief. It shows your lack of faith. It shows your doubt. The problem is when you're asking for signs of any nature, and I'm not here to say don't ask God for signs, but the problem is it is limiting God. The, the problem with the fleece and asking for signs is it is asking God to meet your expectations when in reality he wants to exceed them. He wants to exceed your expectations, not meet them. That's why you shouldn't put a limit on God for something he should meet because maybe he doesn't want to meet that. He wants to show you this, which is light years above and beyond anything that you could imagine. And we're going to skip ahead to verse 33 and says, now all the Midianites, the Amalekites and other Eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the Valley of Jezreel. This is all of the opposing armies now have gathered and they are sitting right on their doorstep. This is all the members of your family that hate your guts coming to your house on Thanksgiving and Christmas to discuss politics and religion with you. This is everything bad in your life coming together and joining forces in the way that they have done and now they are back on your doorstep again. This is the situation going from bad to worse. And if you didn't know, this is 135,000 people. 135,000 people. There's like 400 seats in here. 135,000 people. That is a big problem. That is a lot of people. That is a giant problem. But if you know anything about God, he likes giants because he likes to use giants to slay them to show his glory. So here you have all of the armies getting together, and they're at seven years of oppression. All the fear, all the famine, all the hiding in the caves. And they finally cried out to God, and now it looks even worse. The situation got worse, because this is after they cried out to God. Now all the enemies are right here with them, and it looks worse. And the thing is, we know that God's about to do something, because we have the Bible. And Gideon is the one that heard from the Lord in this time, but they haven't. So they are seeing everything the way that they've seen it for years. And nothing looks like it has changed at all. They've cried out to God and nothing has changed. And I want to know what's going through their minds, because you know this is terrifying. It's as bad as the situation is in, if you've been through any kind of struggle and any type of situation that has gone from bad to worse, and now you're wondering, probably like they are, God, where are you at? When are you going to show up? What are you doing? Because this looks no different. And I've been praying, and I've been praying, and I've been praying, and I've been praying, and I've tried to read my Bible, but it's easier on my phone because I don't really want to get a paper one, but then the notifications come in, so I, you know, and then I look at Facebook instead of you know, the Bible. And, you know, but I'm trying, God, but where are you at? Here they are again. All their enemies, like locusts on their land, trampling the ground, eating all their grass. Now we've got to go back in the caves. And I'm so hungry, God. I'm, I am starving. And my family, we are struggling. <laughs> I heard you. We are struggling to survive. God, where are you? And they are pleading to God. And maybe you have been pleading to God for years and years and years, but he is about to show up and show you his power. He's about to show you his purpose. I want to look at verse, let's put verse 33 back up real quick. Now all the Midianites, the Amalekites and the other Eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan. Next verse. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon and he blew a trumpet Summoning the Abiezrites to follow him. Next verse. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms and also into Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet him. Y'all didn't catch it. Only after all the enemies got together and joined forces, only after the entire enemy got together in one spot, did God's spirit show up. Some, <laughs> ooh, sometimes the, se the season deteriorates beyond what you have imagined. And the situation looks darker than ever before. 
Your court battle's getting dragged out. The job market is worse than ever before, and you're having a hard time finding a job or keeping a job. The bills are piling up, and the money's going away. There's too much month left at the end of the money. Business is at a standstill, and the hospital has no clue what's going on, and your situation is more desperate than ever, and now you're backed into a corner, and you can see no visible way out. But the great C.H. Spurgeon once preached about how when a jeweler... Oh, I love this. When a jeweler is going to show his best diamonds, he puts them against black velvet. Oh, y'all. Mm. What do you always say? They're slow but worth waiting on? The contrast brings out, brings out the luster in the diamonds, the shine. So if you're wondering where God is, if you're wondering what God is doing, because it doesn't really look like he's been doing anything at all, and it looks like the battle's about to get lost, and God, I'm at the breaking point here. If there's anything else that comes against me, God, I'm going to snap, and I have no idea what I'm going to do. And God is saying, just hold on just a little bit longer. It's not quite dark enough yet, and I know it feels heavy, but I put this on you for a reason. Don't think I didn't think about it before I put the weight on you. And God says, hold on, it feels heavy, and I know it feels like it, but it's not just quite the time yet, and you're about to see what happens when you finally step aside to let me show off. You think you're being crushed, but you're more than a conqueror. The darker the night looks, the worse the situation gets. The more grim and gritty and disgusting, the brighter his light will shine, the greater his glory will be, and he wants the contrast of the dark versus the light because this is about so much more than you. He is about to show you the triumph of good over the torment of evil, and when God says, when I step into your situation, there will be no choice but for everyone involved to see me. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and you will see me provide, you will see me shine, and the enemy will see my punishment. You do not mess with my people. Touch not thy anointed. They had no idea what they were doing when they got against you. Because God is with you. They had no idea what they were doing when they stepped in the ring with you. The spirit comes on Gideon. I am. The spirit comes on Gideon and he rallies all the people together. A a whopping 32,000 against 135,000. And it sounds crazy, but the odds are actually only four to one. Kind of doable, right? Depending on, you know, take some some pre-workout and some protein shakes. We could probably probably take a couple people. We might lose a lot, but I think we could do it. So God says, that's that's too many. I'm not not doing it this way. You'll think you did it by yourself. So he, he says... Let everybody that's trembling with fear go away. Get rid of the cowards. Send the cowards home because you can be called but not committed. You can be called but not committed. You can be coming to church without a Bible or a notepad and thinking you're getting fed, but you're really just looking at the menu and that is like window shopping for an appetizer. You can be called, but not committed. He sends the cowards home because sometimes the people that are in your corner aren't really in your corner. They're not against you, but they're not for you either. And if they're not helping to build you up, they're just holding you back. It's time to let them go. Let the cowards go. So they leave. 22,000. Gone. 10,000 are left. Now the odds are 13 to 1. Not a bad number. Hint, hint, Kelsey. We got married on the 13th. 13 to 1. That's worse. That's worse. But if we got some strong people, if Brandon shows up, maybe we'll, we'll be able to do something. It could still happen. So God says, still too many. This is where it gets weird. Gideon takes them down to some water, and whoever cups their hands to drink can stay. But whoever kneels down has to leave. This is showing who is ready to fight, who is prepared to fight. This shows because by cupping their hands and bringing it up, they are remaining alert for an attack. They're not getting down on their knees and letting their guard down. They're not letting their defenses down because how, how can you defend anything if you're always letting your guard down? So in today's terms, this would be the ones who would rather scroll social media than pay attention and help you in your fight. Those go away. Now there's 300. And no, this is not Sparta with all the shirtless people for you sinners out here thinking about that. This is the original. 
These are warriors for God about to fight for their salvation. There is 300, and the the odds are now 450 to 1. 300 people versus 135,000. This only works with trust in God. This only works with faith in God. This literally only works if God shows up. Four to one's okay. 13 to one, they're a little bit worried. 450 to one, uh, just pack a lunch and get ready to lay down and die. No, everybody know it's him. Exactly. This, this has to still be terrifying though. You know, we always talk about Gideon's mighty warriors and the 300. This, this, you, you would still be nervous. <laughs> Let's be real here. If there was 135 people outside of this building ready to kill us when we walked outside, we'd be like, oh God, <laughs> sing it again, please. He's refining us. But it is easier to overcome fear when you're finally fed up with what the enemy has been doing to you for years. And when you truly get fed up and truly fired up, then you can overcome your fears and do what God's wanting you to do. God knows that Gideon is still afraid. And in Judges chapter 7, verse 10, not yet, he sends Gideon and I don't even know, the pea man, to the enemy's camp. I'm not even going to attempt it because my tongue's dry. And no, I don't want water. They arrived. This is so ridiculous. They arrived just as a man is telling his friend about a dream. And this is literally like, you ever watch those movies and like the plot armor? If you know what plot armor is, it's like the hero that just can't die. And it's obvious like there's 97 people shooting a gun at him, but somehow nobody can, like Star Wars with the stormtroopers. And it is literally, it reads like a cheesy movie script. How, I mean, how convenient, right? They, God's like, hey, if you're afraid, take a buddy, go down there. Actually, he didn't even say take a buddy. He said, go down there. And then he took a buddy because he was that afraid. And they show up right as someone is telling them a dream at the exact moment they need to hear it. And you'll think coincidence, but I say Creator. Because sometimes God will put a sign so directly in front of your face that it feels like he has slapped you across the mouth. And Hollywood can film it. They can try to write about it. Lee Child and James Patterson and all them, Stephen King, they can try to make this stuff look like coincidences, but only God can actually make it happen while you're walking it out. And this, <laughs> this man's dream is about a loaf of barley bread that comes down, rolls down, hits the camp, overturns the tent, and all the army dies. And his friend's like, that's Gideon. And if you were the other guy, you'd be like, I was talking about bread. What are you talking about? <clears throat> but you have to understand the culture and the time. And barley bread is connected. Whenever you see barley bread in scripture, it is connected to a Passover experience. It is symbolic of lowliness. It is poor man's bread. Like the bread that we use, <laughs> we use for communion. And you're like, oh. It tastes like I'm eating a styrofoam plate. This is like barley bread. It's disgusting. It's not the first choice. It's not like a Texas roadhouse, you know, garlic roll or whatever they have with that delicious butter that you can put on it. It's irrational. It's kind of like having only 300 men to defeat 130,000, 35,000 people. It also, it doesn't have gluten like wheat does. And I know y'all are like, why are we talking about bread? You're about to see, because this is beautiful. Bread is beautiful. It doesn't have gluten, so it doesn't stick together like wheat does. So in the dream, as it was tumbling down, it would have broken apart into different chunks, kind of like getting whittled down from 32,000 people to 300 men. So how convenient is it that God sends Gideon to hear this dream at this moment? Because sometimes your doubts just need the right dream. Sometimes you're waiting for God to show up and he sends you what you think, what you need in the right moment. So bread, the barley bread, it broke across or it broke up into small chunks. And this is how they know that it's about them. Barley is connected with the Passover. Oh, I'm getting, oh, here we go. (laughs) Barley is connected Y'all know what the Passover is, right? Exodus, where they get delivered. 
Barley is connected with a Passover experience in the text. It literally represents redemption and forgiveness. It represents redemption and freedom. So God chooses Gideon to go down and he sends him down to a man so consumed by doubt to hear a dream about deliverance. And you need to know today that you are about to be delivered. Your your doubts are crushed under the weight of his glory. He wants you to come out of the cage of your thoughts. He wants you to be free from fear. God wants to bless you and you've got to stop beating yourself up because you are exactly who he wants to use. You are exactly where he wants to use you. You are exactly where you need to be for him to show up. So Gideon returns. We're going to speed up. Gideon returns, gives the 300 people his plan. Empty jars, torches, and trumpets. They go down and Gideon issues the signal. Chapter seven, verse 19. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew the trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. That's where he slipped up. He started putting himself at the same with God's glory. Verse 21, while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. And when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other. You could, I'm not quite there yet, but get ready. This is midnight when this happens. This is at the changing of the guard. It's when they changed shifts. This is dark. This is not like living, uh, you city people that have uh, lights everywhere and you can't even see the stars. There's no phones. There's no street lights. There's no buildings. So the Midians hear this noise and they wake up to the sound and the sight of all these torches and they think that they're surrounded. There's a loud noise and lights all around them. And they're so tightly packed together that they literally start attacking each other and they literally defeat themselves. And we face our battles far too often with more fear than faith. We worry for all the wrong reasons. We say the battle is God's, but we wonder where he is. And the problem is not if he will show up. The problem is only when he will show up. And the problem with it is our lack of patience. We keep asking God to show up. When's he going to show up on our battle? And thank you, Scott. We haven't even gotten to the battlefield yet. How is God going to fight for you when you haven't even gotten to the fight yet? When you look at David and Goliath, you look at David and Goliath, and David still had to charge Goliath in order to defeat him. When the Israelites got to Jericho, they still had to walk around it several times for days before the walls finally fell down. And we just saw here how God waited for the entire enemy that was camped together on their doorstep because he waited for the situation to seem at its worst. He waited for the darkest moment of the night before he did his work and his wonder for everybody to see just how amazing he is, how awesome he is, how powerful he is, and how perfect he is. And notice, notice Gideon and the 300 men didn't have a single weapon. There was not one sword in their hands. They had torches, they had jars, and they had trumpets. God doesn't work in the ways that we imagined. That's entirely too limited. God doesn't need a sword to save you. They had a shine and they had a shout. The trumpets represented praise. And the the jars represent us, a container meant to hold something inside. And notice that they were empty jars with a torch inside of it. The torches contain, or the jars contain the torches to be used at just the right moment. They didn't need a weapon because they were the weapon. Isaiah 42, 9, or 49, 2 says, you are a weapon. You have been made into a weapon. And it is time for you to empty yourself because he wants to place something inside of you. The torch represented the Holy Spirit, the fire that is within each of us, deep down inside of us, the holy helper hidden within, ready to be released. God is sending his signal to his people today saying it is time 
to break your jars. It is time to put off the old you and put on the new you, the one that he knew before he formed you. Let his spirit shine through you. Quit hiding the Holy Spirit and let him out. Unleash the fire. Shatter your self-doubt. Shatter your worry. Shatter your self-denial. Shatter your insecurity. Break off your bitterness. Reject your resentment and show off the spirit that is inside of you and God will deliver you. He will lift you out. He will lift you out of oppression. He will lift you out of depression. He will lift you out of addiction. He will lift you out of bondage. He will lift you out of hiding. He will lift you out of self-harm. He will lift you out of suicidal thoughts. God is ready to move through you so that all the world can see his glory. And it is time. It is time for the church to come out of the cave and charge forward in Christ. It is time to push back against the gates of hell and reclaim the territory for the kingdom of God. It's time to stop being tormented in your mind and let God transform you for the kingdom of God. It is time to stop being caged, church. It's time to stop being caged to the church. It's time to charge forward. It's time for the church to be known. It's time for God to be known. It's time for his deliverance to come through and the revival to hit this town, to hit this city, to hit this state, to hit this nation, to hit this world. It is time. The time is now. You are a weapon, not a hostage. You are a weapon, so start acting like one. You are a weapon, so start walking like one. You are a weapon, so start talking like one. You are a weapon, so start praying like one. You are a weapon, so stop living according to what God has already told you you are and get out of your cage and charge forward in Christ. It is time. It is time to break the jars. Break your jars, church. The torch is inside of you. The fire is inside of you. It is time to break it off, to shatter your old self and put on the new you, the one he already knew before you were formed because he's the one that did it. He put everything inside of you everything inside of you. He knows everything about you, all your deep, dark secrets that you're trying to hide. And he still chooses you. You don't choose God. He chose you. You didn't find God. He found you. He's the good shepherd that leaves the sheep to find you because we all went astray. And he came to find us gladly. Not like, oh, you did it again. Gladly. Every time you mess up, go back to him. The devil is the one that wants you to run from him. God is the one that wants you to run to him in your most disgusting moments, in your most disturbing moments, while the needle's still hanging from your arm, before you've even cleared your browser history. He wants you to run to him immediately while you're still in it, because he's the only one that's going to be able to wash it clean, the only one that's able to make it go away, the only one that's going to meet you on the battlefield of whatever you're facing, and the only one that's ever going to be able to fight it for you. This morning, as they, as they worship one final time, the altar is open, and somebody will pray with you. And I pray today that you just come. If you want to do it in your seat, that's fine. But if you want to come and symbolically, symbolically lay it down on the altar and shatter your jars, shatter what is holding you back, to let the Holy Spirit fill you. Empty yourself of yourself. Empty whatever is holding you back. And it could be demons. It could be spirits holding you back. Get them out. Let God get them out. Cast them out in Jesus' name. Rebuke them in Jesus' name. But ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit because the Bible does say if you empty it and you don't fill it with something, it will be worse. God is here today for a reason and you are here today for a reason shatter your jars move forward quit being caged in your mind and I am preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to y'all because I know what goes on up in here she does a little bit but not all of it because there's not enough medication in the world that can protect you from those kind of thoughts Shatter the jars and charge forward. It is time for the church to be known again. It is time for God to be known again. It is time for revival to hit this land. It is time. You are never alone. He is with you. 
every moment, every day, every hour. People always talk about how those far from God. But I'm going to challenge that. I don't think you can be far from God because he's always right there for you when you turn around. You can feel far from God and your actions can have you far from God. But he is immediately there when you need him. Every single time you call on him. And if your situation looks the worst, just like the black velvet that gets put behind the diamonds to bring out the shine, it is in your darkest hour that God chooses to show up and show out in the most glorious way. So now now you can see it, now your family can see it, and now every single one around you can see it. That is the purpose of the darkness, to let his light shine. And you have it within you. You have it within you. This morning... Come and lay it down. Whatever's holding you back as they worship, know that you're not alone. Lay it down. Shatter your jars and pick up the torch of the Holy Spirit. God is with you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's message. If you did, make sure that you share and subscribe so that we can get you these sermons as soon as they are available. I'd like to take a moment and thank everyone that's a part of the family. Whether you serve with us or give financially, it's because of you that we are able to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus. If you have any questions or would like to get more involved, click the link in the description. Thank you. Have a blessed week.